welcome. We're just opening the doors for the Owls of Paper Court Meadow talk. Um, we're really looking forward to it tonight. So um, hope you have are sitting back, have a cup of tea or a cocktail waiting because it's going to be a really fantastic program tonight. Um, so let's see. So we've got people coming in. We're just going to wait for a minute or so more and let everybody join us. Get ready. Um, hope that everybody's having a nice evening and enjoying a little bit of the warmer weather. Thank goodness that cold weather this past weekend. Oh, that was cold. Um, but yeah, so so again, it's uh, just to make sure that you're here for the Owls of Paper Court Meadow, the um, the webinar. Um, and we will, I'm just going to, I think I'll start just on seven. So on my computer, it just says one more minute. So we're almost there. People are still coming in. We've got uh, over 50 people coming tonight, which is fantastic. Um, I know some of you were hoping to go on walks as we all were, but um, this is a, a next best thing on a nice kind of chilly evening, sitting back and learning about these. Well, let's see, I'm, I have seven o'clock on mine. So um, we've got pretty much, we've got a pretty full audience. So I think we'll start. Um, welcome, uh, my name's Sue O'Regan. I'm gonna be hosting tonight along with uh, my co-host, Victoria Pinder. Um, and but you're here to see uh, Katie Fielding and Zoe Channon. Uh, they are going to be telling you everything about Alice. It's going to be a fantastic evening. Uh, just a, a little bit of housekeeping. Um, some of you will probably have been on uh, a lot of these webinars before and you'll know, but on the bottom of your screen, you'll see a, a Q&A button. Throughout the evening, during the presentation, if something pops in your mind, something that you'd like to ask these guys after the presentation, just type it in there. And at the end, after the presentation's over, uh, Victoria's gonna be going through all of those questions and making sure that they're um, asked to both Zoe and Katie. Um, and you also have a chat button. Now that's set up so that if you have, I don't know, a technology problem or something that you would just like um, Victoria and I to know about, send it in there and we'll be able to respond to you directly. Um, so I think that's pretty much it. It's gonna be about an hour tonight um, and then uh, with questions afterwards. So um, get ready for a fantastic evening. I'm gonna hand you over to um, Zoe and Katie. Enjoy. Thanks, Sue. Well, hi, everybody. Thank you so much for coming. I'm just going to share my screen with you. And Zoe, I'm going to make sure that you can see that because we've had. I can, yeah. Fast. Yeah, it's loud and clear. Lovely. Well, thank you, everybody, for coming along this evening. We're so glad that we're able to offer you this. I know a lot of people were really hoping to come on the owl walks. I know some people didn't even manage it last year due to being thwarted by the weather a little bit. So we really wanted to be able to offer you something that fits with the times, with the strange times that we're living through and everything's going virtual. So why can't uh, exploring a nature reserve and seeing some beautiful owls go virtual too? So just a couple of bits from me first. I do have a dog in the room with me who I couldn't quite bear to shut out because she didn't want to. Uh, she is usually very well behaved. She has been for a walk. She's had lots of treats, but occasionally does react and bark to owl noises. So we'll see how it goes if I may have to take her out if she doesn't behave, but that's sometimes how these things go. So we're just going to go through the slides. So we're going to be talking about paper court because we enjoy it so much. We are the ones that usually deliver our walks on site. So we're great, really pleased that we can share a little bit of it with you. My presentation doesn't want to move on. There we go. There you go, the wonders of technology. So tonight, we're going to really try and make you feel like you're at Paper Court. So sharing lots of photos, obviously showing you the owls as well. We're going to tell you a bit about Paper Court Meadows and what makes it so fantastic for the owl species that call it home, as well as a lot of other wildlife as well. Obviously, we're going to tell you about the owls that we find at Paper Court Meadows, but also the other British species as well. And then also a bit of owl info about what makes them such iconic 
and fantastic British wildlife and such incredible hunters and birds of prey as well. So to start with, I mentioned that we have often been thwarted by the weather. So you may see a pond on the left and a stream on the right, and you would be wrong. And I think the van at the back gives it away a little bit. And this is actually on the left, the car park for where we park to usually go for the walks. And on the right is the path where we would normally go along to get onto the reserve. And this was the quite incredible and destructive flooding of last year, which meant that some of our walks were delayed and even cancelled last year. So apologies if you were booked onto those walks last year and were unable to come along. And then this year, obviously, we've been thwarted by COVID. So Zoe, it was you that took these photos. I don't know if you want to say anything else about it. It was, yes. Muggins here was sent out to scope out the site. And yeah. I could uh, gladly report back that uh, things were not going super well um, with respect to getting people on site and had to make an emergency phone call into the events team to, uh, to stop the walk. So, uh, yes. But uh, safe to say, wellies were worn. Yeah. <laughs> and these were taken maybe... Was it the day before or the morning of the war? It was actually the morning of the war because we were trying to assess it as late as possible to give it a chance. Mm -hmm. no. So we, we were really desperate for the walks to go ahead because we love them as much as the people that come along on them. And we kind of thought, well, the car park's flooded. Maybe if we can actually get onto site, it'll all be OK. Unfortunately not. Uh, you'd be right in asking, where does the river end and the land begin? Well, we weren't really willing to find out at this point. So sadly, last year, we weren't able to run some of them. But uh, as you can see, it's a very wet site and wet woodland, wet meadows, wet grassland is fantastic for wildlife, you'll be pleased to hear. So there are other ways to get onto sites and it's not completely flooded at the moment. So. I cannot stress enough what a wet site it is. So even if you are able to park, walk onto the site and along, it's still incredibly wet. And these are pictures I took earlier in the year when I was exploring. Uh, so if you do want to try and make your way there in your own time, I can only advise wellies um, and dressing appropriately. But if you do, you're rewarded with beautiful views. It puts on a fantastic sunset as well as lots of lovely displays of owls if you're lucky enough. And throughout this presentation, you're going to be seeing a lot of pictures of sunset because obviously this is the best time to view the owls and quite often when we go down there. So prepare yourself for a lot of atmospheric shots along with those lovely owls. So perhaps at this point you're feeling a little bit nostalgic and maybe thinking, oh, it's such a shame. Covid's dragging everything down. I'm not able to do anything. I would have really liked to have gone on one of these walks. Well, I thought I'd just try and bring you back to reality a little bit. And uh, like we said, it is very wet. And this was a picture of Zoe, sadly, is when we were planning one of our walks last year after she had fallen and gotten stuck in a ditch. Zoe? I mean, I'm not looking for sympathy, right? But this picture is very misleading. The sunshine, the blue sky <laughs> imply that we're out on a summer's day, but it was February, it was absolutely freezing, and we were on site for about another hour after this. So. I called myself a trooper after that walk. <laughs> she was very brave. I did give her the option of us going home and maybe just re reassessing and coming back another day, but she, she certainly soldiered on. Carried on. <laughs> so you haven't fallen in a ditch. You're not soaking cold on site and it's not raining. You are tucked up warm with a beverage of choice and you We'll be looking at some of the lovely shots that we've had of papercore, learning a bit about some owls. So it's not soon. And full marks if you can spot the barn owl in this picture, which was taken on my uh, mobile phone. So as you can see, you do get some nice views at times. So hopefully you're feeling like you're settled in. We've set the atmosphere. I'm going to pass over to Zoe now to tell you a bit more about papercore meadows. Thanks, Katie. So let's get orientated, shall we? Because some people might not know where this this um, this site is. So on the left of the screen there, you can see Old Woking um, and just the outline of that. And then just about a kilometre east, you can see two sites that are outlined in green on here. The bottom one is actually paper marshes. So that is a, a small site. It's 
permit only and um, it's mostly reed beds and sort of wet scrapes etc it's brilliant for for water birds we get water rail there and, and various reed warblers etc um, and then just above that you'll see the site that's a lot more squiggly and outlined that's paper court meadows and the word paper court i was looking into it earlier just to try and understand a bit more about it and it seems to have sort of anglo-saxon origins and certainly the surrounding lands has long been um, mined for minerals all around. So there's obviously some, some linkage in there. Um, the total site is about 18 hectares. It's not huge, so um, a walk around there is, is quite easy. And it's situated on the floodplain of the River Way. Can I have the next slide, Katie? Thank you. So why do owls like paper courts? It's a good question to ask. I mean, basically in short, it's just an amazing mix of, of different habitats. You've got the entire river network that surrounds various sides of it. Um, you've got fairly mature woodlands around it as well. Dotted within the grassland area, you've got um, patches of scrub, you've got hedges around the outside. So it's it's got it all really. Um, the woodland and the scrub provide vital um, shelter for those owls themselves to kind of nest and roost and rest. They also provide a home for mammals and bats and invertebrates and all sorts of other species. The next slide, Katie. Thank you. So us conservationists call a site like paper court species rich, but I'm pretty certain that an owl just calls it dinner. So with everything that lives there, it's a veritable smorgasbord for an owl uh, who handily have a very varied diet. So I've put just a mere few examples here, um, mostly because I kind of like the species, I guess. So a menu favourite in an owl staple on the top left hand side is the harvest mouse. Picture here. Um, it's absolutely tiny and it weighs about as much as a two pence piece. So really for an owl, it's going to be uh, pretty light to catch, although they're pretty nimble, so they're not so easy to get hold of. Um, harvest mice really like the sort of tussocky grassland areas um, that paper court is. So, I mean, it's an ideal habitat for them, really. Um, in the bottom left, you've got the grass snake. Um, it's our longest snake in the UK. It's really fond of wet habitats, you know, if anyone's got ponds in their garden or sometimes even if you're lucky enough to have a swimming pool, um, you, you can quite often see grass snakes there. So they spend their time sort of hunting around for amphibians and fish and reptiles, etc. other smaller reptiles. Um, but it's also prey itself and, and owls will catch those if they happen across it. To me, that sounds dreadful. Uh, I, I have a massive snake phobia and I'm not particularly keen to be around them. But also when grass snakes are caught, they emit this foul smelling substance from their anal glands. So I'm not sure they're gonna be the first choice for, for me on the menu, that's for sure. And the bat that's shown on here is actually a Dorbenton's. Um, a common name for it, people call it water bat, it, it loves sort of wet areas and, and feeding on the insects around there. Most commonly, I guess, um, the bats at paper court are the pipistrelle bats, um, which absolutely are eaten by all three owls there, so that's the tawny, the short-eared and the barn owl too. It seems a bit of a shame really, doesn't it? But um, it's, I guess that's just the way the cookie crumbles. And last but not least, in the bottom right hand corner, I couldn't resist. I mean, really, if I'm being blunt, it's an example of a small bird that the owl would like to eat. But um, it's actually a male stone chat here. Um, and it's a real favourite of mine that you can see at Paper Court Meadows. I love seeing these when we go, when we're walking in. We always get fantastic views of the stone chats as we're you in do. areas. Yeah. I mean, the numbers that you get there are crazy sometimes, aren't they? They really are. They really are. It's lovely. So this may look like grass and it is grass, but it's not your common or garden everyday grass, of course. It's rather a hidden mosaic of interest. Well, well I suppose to somebody like me, I know that I'm a bit geeky about these things sometimes. The picture on the left hand side is slender tufted sedge. Now, you might go, well, who cares about that? It just looks like a, a grass that I might have in my garden. Well, it's actually part of a Carex family and on paper court we have a really large colony of it there and it's, it's quite rare actually. So in 
No, I absolutely loves the wet conditions there. And it's characterized by this really acid green color that you can see coming out. Um, it can actually grow quite tall. So when you actually see it on site, it is, it's quite a sight really. And then on the right hand side, we've got tufted hair grass, looks completely different. Um, it's tussock forming. It absolutely loves wet conditions and it has this really cunning way of feeding oxygen down from the top of the plant to its roots. So they stay alive even in these wet conditions. So it could sort of outcompete some of the other species that, that wouldn't like it there. And it's really frondy and wavy. You can see the seed heads there, which are really nice. And it's a great refuge for invertebrates and small mammals, which in turn, you know, effectively are, are prey for the owls. And then comes the colour. So if you visit Paper Court at um, between spring and summer, there's an absolute cacophony of um, plants and flowers there. I've again, I've picked out only a few here. Um, you, you know, the list is endless and I could have gone on, but just to orientate your, yourselves on this slide, on the top left, you've got water mint. Um, absolutely loves wet conditions. I'm sure most of you would have walked through wet environments and can actually smell the mint wafting up. Um, actually eat it just like normal mint, but obviously you, you'd have to be pretty careful that you, you know what sort of um, water it's sucking up, etc. Just to the right of that, you've got bird's foot trefoil. Most of you would have seen that on loads of our sites, I would imagine. Um, and then to the right of that, it looks very similar, but it's actually meadow vetchling. It's quite a long, straggly plant and absolutely loves sort of rough grassland. Um, and it's a member of the pea family, which I think you can kind of make out really from the stems on there. Bottom left-hand corner, you've got meadow sweet. So it does actually have quite a sweet scent to it, but if you crush it, if you start to crush it, it starts to smell quite medicinal. And I think it was used in tinctures and other things in days of old um, for medical reasons. Quite from flowers, it's a bit of a late flower that one. It can run through from June almost to September, so um, it's around quite a bit. Next to that one plant that I absolutely love, it's the marsh thistle. You get this enormous sphere um, that can be up to seven foot tall that just comes out of nowhere and has these bright purple flowers on. Insects absolutely love it. It's a real favourite for bees, it's a real favourite for butterflies, um, and we have quite a lot of it on site, so and it just looks really sort of architectural, uh, slightly odd in the way that it grows, but I do love that one. Next to that, just for a bit of a different colour, uh, you've got amphibious distort, and then the final picture on the, the, the right hand side is the marsh stitch wall, and I just love this. I love the, the sort of pale star-like flowers on here. It's a, a creeping, rambling plant that sort of gets all over the place, so certainly look out for, for those when, when you actually make it to site. So um, what do we do there? We graze the site actually um, every year. It's in countryside stewardship. It's a site of special scientific interest. So we do get a small amount of money from Natural England to help manage it. Um, and then we go through assessment with Natural England to see how we're doing against all the, the target species and the desirable species that we want on there. But why do we choose cattle? Well, there's a number of reasons, actually. We have a herd of about 450 or so belted Galloways. In the picture on the right, you can see a couple of nosy parkers uh, coming up to the, um, to the camera there. Um, they're really good at dealing with wet conditions underfoot. That doesn't really bother them. They don't have too many issues with their hooves. Um, they're a really tough species, so I mean they're they're built for much harsher climates than um, than Surrey can offer them, um, and they go through conservation grazing and training, so they get used to being around people and dogs, and they just sort of mind their own business. Um, and the reason why we like cattle is they're, I mean this isn't a technical term, but they're sort of random grazers, so when they actually are grazing, they sort of wrap their tongue around um, the grass or the plant and they rip that out. So it might come out fully by its roots or it might half come out. So it creates this really sort of diverse mosaic of grassland around that isn't uniformly eaten like you would imagine a sheep grazed field would be. Um, 
So it really helps to keep dominant grasses at bay um, so that some of the smaller species have got an opportunity to come through. And also they're quite heavy. So they trample the ground um, and they can create sort of patches of bare ground, which in themselves are tiny little micro habitats of, of, of wet ground. But it also provides um, a sort of more open area for other seeds to set um, so you get this mosaic of age of plants there as well. So, so that's why that's why we do that. Anyway, enough about cows. We are here to talk about owls. So these are the three owls that we'll be covering mostly today that you can see at Papercourt Meadows. So the one on the far left is the short-eared owl, and the quizzical looking character in the middle is the barn owl. And then you've got the tawny owl on the right hand side. So I'm going to hand back to Katie at this stage, who's going to take us through some tawny owl facts. Thanks, Zoe. Love hearing all about paper court. So, yes, I have the lovely job of talking to you about the tawny owl. So, it's an absolutely beautiful bird, and it is one of our most well known and iconic British owls. Um, not least of all because of that beautiful plumage. And it's not just there to be pretty, it's there as camouflage. So tawny owls really are the definition of a woodland specialist. They nest in trees, they spend a lot of their time in woodland, they only come out at night and they roost in trees in the daytime. So they really need to blend in as much as possible. So they have that dark tawny colouring with lighter colours running through, which is supposed to mimic bark, but also the way that light comes through leaves and that kind of dappled shade um, is really good for them. And they're able to hide away in the daytime and then come out at night. They also have really distinctive eyes. They're the only British species that have those wholly dark brown eyes, really, really penetrating if you're lucky enough to see one like this in the daytime. Now, they are birds that are often heard rather than seen. So I'm now going to play you the tawny owl call and we're going to this is the one that amber amber dog dislikes the most so hopefully we're going to be okay if i can get my there it keeps disappearing oh. there we go no there you go there's that really iconic owl sound we've got through it with the dog we'll move on to the next slide so like i said the tawny owl is is much more often heard than seen and what's so interesting about the call of the tawny owl is that it's not one owl that delivers the whole call it's actually the females that make that twit sound and it's actually the males that make the too and together when they're calling to each other is that iconic twit twoo sound together, uh, which not all people really realize. Um, I quite often hear around where um, I live, just the males and you can just hear the twoo and you think, oh, it's not quite found a mate yet. And then even occasionally just hear the female as well, but people don't always associate with it being an owl or certainly not a tawny owl because they only think of that stereotypical sound when it's joined up. Um, obviously, like I said, the tawny owl is a woodland specialist. They only really come out at night, at night. And that really iconic sound has started to be associated with the darkness and woodlands and even become a little bit spooky. And it's been massively adopted by horror films for decades now. And more specifically, American horror films. Which, if you look at this map, which shows the distribution of the tawny owl, is really interesting because you can see in the dark blue there that they have colonized, colonized most of Europe and even parts of Asia, but they haven't actually managed to jump the pond yet. So that call has become so iconic that it's even made its way into popular films and culture in America, even if the bird itself has not. So a little bit more about the lovely tawny owl. They are actually monogamous. They just mate with one other bird um, and they're extremely territorial. Um, they boast as many as 50,000 pairs, even though they're not actually present in Ireland. So considering you'll see some of the numbers that we have with the other owls, they're really quite an abundant owl. 
However, their conservation status reached, recently dropped from green to amber, and that's because there's been a bit of a decline in numbers. So conservationists are worrying about them a little bit, but hopefully that will stabilize and we'll get that status back up to green eventually. I just had to share these pictures. These I didn't take these. These were sent in to us by another volunteer on a different site, but at Sheepleys. And these are two gorgeous fledgling uh, little tawny owls. And I'm so jealous to, I have never had views of a tawny owl like this in the day, let alone fledglings, and certainly not long enough to be able to take gorgeous pictures like this. But I think it's such a fantastic example of just how amazing that camouflage is. Where does the bark end and the owl begin? I couldn't tell you. It, they just blend in so well and it works brilliantly with that dappled light as well. So yeah, a true woodland specialist um, working with their environment with perfect camouflage. Now I'll hand over to Zoe to tell you a little bit about the barn owl. Thanks Katie. Can we knock on the slide? Perfect. <laughs> So, barn owl, um, side facing head, rather an iconic view of the uh, face as well. Um, so it's commonly known as the white or screech owl, so this might be a good time to play the sound by Katie if we can, so that people mm. hear the noise that barn owl makes. Very screechy. <laughs> And some feather ruffling. <laughs> and there we go, the final screech. I mean, I am of the view that it's a sound that only a mother could love, but maybe I'm biased. Um, it's long known, long been known as a farmer's friend, really, uh, the barn owl. Uh, really favours eating rats and mice um, and keeps those at bay around farm areas. Um, if the weather is good enough, they are actually capable of producing more than one brood a year um, if they start early enough. They typically lay between sort of four and six eggs, usually between the sort of months of March and, and August if, if they're going on to have a second brood. Um, baby owls are called owlets, which is quite cute, although perhaps not that imaginative. Um, and in the UK, we've got about 4,000 pairs. These figures are all approximate, sort of based on latest data that we can get hold of. An absolutely stunning picture of a barn owl in flight here. Um, and you certainly get views um, like that on paper court as well. Um, the conservation status of the barn owl is currently considered to be green, although um, there are some things that affect their numbers. Um, for example, it depends how much prey is around from one year to the next as to how much that owl can catch um, for itself, but also for its owlets. Um, you know, they, they do favour barns and buildings like that to nest in. Um, and some of those are obviously being converted into dwellings um, or they might have been removed um, in order to, to free up more land, etc. And they are quite vulnerable to traffic. Um, you know, I'm hoping that some of you will have been lucky enough to have been driving around country lanes, um, you know, sort of dusk time and sort of looked to the right and seen a, a barn owl flying across the fields. They fly quite low um, and they can they can often hit car windscreen. So there's a few things that, that get to them, but um, certainly at Paper Court, um, they're pretty happy there. There's surrounding barns, which we're pretty certain that they're nesting in. Um, and they're pretty free to roam without um, particular intervention. So I um, am now going to hand to Katie, who is going to go through short-eared owls for us. Thanks, Zoe. So yes, I'm going to be talking to you about the lovely short-eared owl, who doesn't actually look that dissimilar from the tawny owl, which I spoke about before. Um, although with very similar markings, it is once again camouflage but for a very different habitat type. So although known as the short-eared owl, it's also known as the bog owl because they breed in the uplands in boggy, 
wet moorland areas and they nesting on the ground they're incredibly vulnerable especially their young so that camouflage is really vital to them it also has the added bonus of making them incredibly beautiful if you get views like this they also have those really piercing eyes those yellow bands with the dark pupils as well so very different eyes to a tawny owl if you were ever confused between the two species and a short-eared owl is a bit bigger as well uh, they really are open country birds, so when they're on the ground and nesting, they're very hidden away and difficult to see, but they will hunt out in the open and can often be seen in the day and are often the bird we first see at paper court when we are out on a walk. And I'm just going to tell you their call. So hopefully you could hear that quite small sound that they make, but also that kind of tucka 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 sound. Well, that's not a call. That's actually them beating their wings, which is involved in their mating, which I'll mention in a moment. But like I said, they really are those that open country bird. They glide around across the tops of grassland and scrubland and picture them out on paper court in a shot like this just sort of gliding effortlessly over that grassland and over the pockets of scrub, looking for small mammals or other things that they can find. When we arrive, we see them first around or just before sunset. And then just as the sun's going down, they seem to just take themselves off very quietly and will tuck her down, hunker down in some of that grass or on the edge of the scrub. And that's when we start to see the barn owls coming out in the evening. It's, it's just a lovely transition. I'm sure you'll agree, Zoe, just being able to. Yeah, like definitely. I was looking at that picture that you were showing of the short-eared owl before, and I often think that they're one of the more startled owls. They seem to <laughs> look uh, surprised whenever you see them. <laughs> they certainly do. So they're a very nomadic bird, actually. So they spend a lot of the winters on lowland estuaries and coastal plains and areas like paper court meadows, only to make their way all the way up to the uplands and to moorland areas for breeding in the summer. And like I said, they incorporate this wing clapping into their sort of mating rituals. And I don't know if you know, Zoe, but is it for whether they're, they're trying to attract a mate or defend territories with that wing classic. Yeah, it's part It's part of a display, you know, a bit like nightjars do, so, yeah. Ah. And they have massively fluctuating numbers, and that's because almost all of their diet is those small mammals, and small mammal numbers fluctuate so much, and so it really has an impact on shorted out numbers. So in the summertime, there can be between 620 and 2,180 pairs, and then in the winter between 5,000 and 50,000 individuals. Now, it might sound quite alarming that those numbers can fluctuate quite so much. And obviously it means animals dying off when there's not enough prey around. But this is an example of a functioning and healthy ecosystem. When prey numbers are high, the predator numbers go up, but because the predator numbers go up, it depresses the amount of prey available and therefore, if there's not enough prey, then those predator numbers go down. And then once the predator numbers are down, the prey numbers come back up again. And that really is a healthy ecosystem. And unfortunately, some of the ecosystems aren't quite complete or are not working very well in the UK. So we get predator numbers which are very high because they're protecting, eating other things and going through our rubbish potentially. But it's nothing to worry about with those fluctuating numbers with a short-eared owl. And this one's conservation status is also amber. And I'll pass over to Zoe for the slightly stern looking little owl. Hey, look at that face. It's so very, very cross and like it definitely doesn't really want to be here. <laughs> Which is funny actually, because this owl is not a native owl. It was actually introduced um, into various areas of this country actually in the 1800s. Why? Well, People just liked it and they thought it would complement the owls that we already had here. And um, bizarrely, it has actually been one of those introductions that hasn't really caused chaos and mayhem in the process of doing it. So it's it's been pretty successful in filling a niche in animal areas and, and making a bit of a name for itself, really. It's it's the, the pictures here don't really do it justice. It's a small owl. Um, it's it's no bigger than a song thrush, really, just to give you an idea of how big it really is in in 
I was going to say person then, that's not true, is it? Al, Al, person. Um, and it makes a funny little sound. Can you play that one, Katie? For yes, of course. It's a lovely little sound, that one. Mm. It sounds little, doesn't it? It does. Uh, so it tends to nest in um, any small hole, really, that it can fit into. Again, um, sort of if the if the pairs survive, they 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 do tend to be monogamous, and they they like to re return to the same nest each year as well. Um, they are a little bit earlier in their breeding, so they tend to breed between um, sort of January and March and lay between about sort of three to five eggs, and you know, obviously it's up to nature as to how many of those survive um it's got a pretty varied diet which again really does these birds a favor you know it's looking around for mice and voles and insects and worms and beetles and things like that to live on so um certainly paper court um we haven't specifically seen them there when we've been there but i wouldn't be overly surprised if they were around or, or certainly had been seen passing through So there's about, I mean, these figures are from 2009, you can see that. So there's about 5,700 pairs, or there certainly was then. It, it's not a well-studied owl, I would say. If you actually go around searching for data, it is patchy. Um, and it's quite difficult to, to, to sort of really establish where we are. It's thought to be in decline, but there's not really a consensus, I would say, as to what's contributing to that. Um, there's going to be various things. There's going to be the obvious thing about prey, which we talked about consistently throughout this presentation. Um, but, you know, climate changes will have some impact. And also there have been some issues with um, environmental contaminants. If they get into to rats or mice, then, you know, in turn, the bird eats that, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, nobody's really come to a conclusion, I would say, about um, one specific cause on that. So its conservation status at the moment is not assessed. Mm. Although hopefully that will change over time. It is interesting with their conservation statuses, isn't it? That yeah. there's only 4,000, um, I can't remember if it was individuals or pairs of barn owls, and they're yeah. green. And then you have around 50,000 pairs of tawny owls, and they're considered amber. So it's not just about their numbers, is it? No, it's really not. And actually, I think sites like the RSPB, they, they give you quite a good definition of exactly why they're coming down on um, these statuses for, for each of the species as well. And um, because it's not um, it's not always um, like for like um, details, then, um, like you said, it can look quite strange sometimes. And it is about where these birds can fill niches and it wouldn't it just wouldn't be feasible for the whole country to be covered in barn owls because there's not enough habitat potentially so it, it is more exactly. about how the bird is faring whether those numbers are going up and down which I always find interesting and yeah I totally agree <laughs> he's not even assessed at the moment bless him. I know bless him he looks cross about that as well <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> so here we go the long ear down look at that picture it's absolutely brilliant I mean you can see where it's got its name from and um, it just shows the owl in all its glory here. You've got these big, long ear tufts at the top. And again, this, this amazing camouflage, which we've seen in some of the other owls as well. And I would say that that blends very well with the um, wood that, that that's resting on. So what about long-eared owls? They are the most nocturnal of all of our owls. It would be it's not impossible, but it would be highly unusual to see any of these animals, um, owls flying around during the day. It's incredibly secretive and, um, you know, it spends its entire life sort of hiding itself away and sneaking around via the, um, under the cover of darkness. It's quite a slim bird. It's actually not dissimilar in size to a tawny owl, but tawny owls are sort of somehow a bit more round. And this has got quite a long body and much slimmer. And you can see in this picture that it's got not yellow eyes like the short-eared owls, but it's got orange eyes here, which is quite 
sometimes if you see a long ear dowel quite quickly, you, you might mistake it for a short ear, but the eye colour is one of the distinguishing features there. And even its noise is quite secretive as well. It's definitely no show off. You have to listen quite carefully for this one. Oh, I've managed oh. to stop sharing. <laughs> That's okay. We'll <laughs> go back again. <laughs> I just love technology. It's my best you friend. Do. I think I'm actually going to struggle because it's right by the stop sharing button. Hang on. Oh, it's so close. Hang on, if I can just, nope, I stopped. Nope. <laughs> Don't worry. We well, think we'll have to just miss the long kid. We'll miss that. It's not it's terribly, so um... close to the stop sharing button. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. <laughs> Misplaced sounding. Don't worry about that. We'll come back to that. Um, it likes to roost, uh, as it says here, communally in really dense cover. So if, you're, if your woodland area is not that dense, it's not going to be the preferred habitat for this kind of owl. Um, we've got sort of generally around 3,500 pairs in the UK, but every year they're boosted quite significantly, actually, by winter migrants that come in from Scandinavia um, and Eastern Europe and other areas. Um, to hunt over here. Just going to see. Oh, I thought I'd maybe got it then. I'm just going to try one other thing and see if I can uh, get it. Tell me if you're seeing all of this or is that still on the presentation? Mm, no, it's it's clicked. Well, it's clicked off until we can see you scrolling through it. Yeah. Okay, let's not worry about it. We'll just take okay. No, thank you for trying. That's my fault. The lesson learned from implanting the sound file too high. <laughs> so long eared owls. You can see this. There's a brilliant picture here on the right hand side of the long eared owls, and you can see how long its wings are in comparison to its body. It's almost <laughs> almost slightly farcical in a way, but um, certainly makes it quite an astonishing sight. Um, it tends to nest in. I can only describe it as sort of other animals old nest. So if you've got some leftover squirrel dray, or you've got some mouldy old um, wood pigeon nest or something like that, the uh, long eared owl will, will love that. And it, it doesn't have to go to the effort of actually building anything itself. Um, it tends to start thinking about um, nesting for about, from about February, um, but then really the sort of main activity is sort of March to May time. Um, it's a funny species, this one, because it really favours coniferous woodland and, and and that's really where it prefers to be. So you'll rarely find it in, in other places. And I think it just likes the density and the cover that's within there. But it does like woodland that then borders onto, um, the picture shows, more open spaces, which obviously it's going to be using um, to hunt. Um, when it does uh, find a mate, they typically lay between two and 10 eggs, it's actually quite a lot in comparison to, to all of the other owls. Not all of them will survive, of course, but you know, that's that still sub could be quite substantial. Um, and at the moment, its conservation status is green, so it's, it's doing quite well. So we call it the long-eared owl, but actually the points that you can see on the top of its head are not actually ears. They're more, they're more ear tufts. Um, and there's a few reasons why it's why they're there. Um, as it says here, um, it can be used to make the owl appear larger while they're perched and therefore um, less likely to come under attack themselves. Um, and they do perform a role in sort of channeling sounds um, into the owl when it's hunting and sort of trying to find mice, etc. Um, they can actually flatten the ear tufts against their head. And when they look like that, they really do look like short eared owls. So you then have to sort of start looking at other diagnostic features like the eyes um, plus wing patterns, et cetera, which is slightly different. But yeah, I mean, that's that that's the view that we always imagined of long ear down. So prefer it when they keep their ear tufts up. I always think of long eared owls as being quite a large owl, but actually they're really quite slender and small. And I think it's because they when they're sat like that and they've got those ear tufts up, yeah. 
really resemble a European eagle owl in my head. So I imagine these giant birds and actually they're really quite small. No, I think you're right. And if you look at the length of the wing there, that is significantly longer than its actual body, which is sort of hidden behind it in this picture. So yeah, I mean, it, it looks much bigger than it actually is. Yeah. Um, if anyone is ever lucky enough to actually see one in the wild, I think you'll all be surprised by how... <laughs> I am not lucky enough to have seen one in the world, sadly, but there we go. I once was, uh, had, well, someone trained a telescope on a patch of scrub for me and was adamant that there was one in there, but I can't honestly say that I saw anything that did <laughs> patch of scrub. <laughs> really close. <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, thanks, Zoe, for finishing off the owls. So those are the five British species that we have in the UK, three of which call Papercourt Meadows home, at least for part of the year. I'm now going to go on to tell you a little bit about the unique features to owls and what makes them so iconic, but also such fantastic hunters and successful at Papercourt Meadows. So most birds, um, when they're flying, equals a lot of noise, a lot of wind turbulence and that swooshing sound. And generally, the larger the bird and the faster it flies, then the louder that sound. But not owls, they can fly almost silently. And this is because of unique wing and feather features, easy for me to say, <laughs> is specific to those owl species and they're able to actually reduce locomotion-induced sound so that air turbulence and swooshing sound, they're able to completely dampen it. Um, and not only that, with that flying silently, they're also able to fly really, really slowly. So even quite large species, such as barn owls, are able to fly as slow as two miles an hour. And this is because they have really quite large wings relative to their body mass, as is sort of demonstrated here by this tawny owl in flight. So they are not only able to be really, really quiet, but fly unusually slowly, which is very helpful when you're trying to spot them out on paper court meadows and they're not just <laughs> fly at the speed of light like kestrels and other birds of prey might do. So how are they able to dampen that sound? So we're just gonna get a little bit geeky with you, but not for too long, I promise. So they have these really unique structures within their feathers that serve as a silencer. And they have so a few of these adaptations. There's one is that they have these comb-like serrations on the leading edge of their wing feathers. And you can see an example of that in the on the right hand side there, that left hand picture outlined in red. So that is those comb-like serrations on the leading edge. And what these do is they break up that turbulent air, which leads to that swooshing sound and break it down so it's much smaller streams of air. And like I said before, that generally the larger the bird and the faster it's flying, there is more air turbulence and more swooshing. So if you can break up that air turbulence, then you can reduce that sound, which is what these little serrations on the wings do. Not only that, but there is this unique velvety texture within owl feathers. And if you've ever been at potentially like country fairs and shows and things like that, and or falconry, uh, demonstrations and you've been lucky enough to maybe touch an out they really feel incredibly soft and velvety and that is to sort of dampen and absorb sound even further even after it's been broken up if that wasn't enough then if they weren't already the stealthiest birds out there they also then have this trailing edge on the on the wing as well and it's a soft fringe and that's demonstrated in that box on the right hand side the other one in the red and that just further streamlines the air um, bringing down that air turbulence even further and absorbing more sound which is why they are the stealthiest ninja birds out there and able to fly so silently and there's actually a really interesting study that one woman did looking at whether these features were associated with how owls hunt. So they had a hypothesis that those that needed to be really stealthy, so either needed to be really quiet to hear their prey or needed to be quiet to sneak up on their prey so their prey wouldn't hear them. So prey that potentially has good hearing like small mammals would have more exaggerated features. So bigger little combs and serrations on their wings and larger soft fringe. And they were able to prove that hypothesis. So those animals that are hunting 
at night or that need to be really quiet to hear their prey if it's like buried in the grass or prey with very good hearing such as mice had more exaggerated features so larger serrations on their wings than say a species that hunts fish or even um, invertebrates and insects which is really interesting so it just demonstrates how much evolution has occurred here to make birds to make these owls quite so silent so not only are they super stealthy they've got a lot of other adaptations as well so they have these really large forward facing eyes, which isn't very stereotypical of birds of prey. They have that very stereotypical though, hawk like beak, which really puts them in the bird of prey family. Um, a very flat face, which until it really gets pointed out to you, I never really quite, I, obviously you see the bird and you know it's got a flat face, but I never really clocked quite how flat it was before. And not only that, but they've got this, these lovely circles around their faces and obviously a barn owl is more like a heart shape and it's a very conspicuous circle of feathers actually that makes it up but then also a facial disc around each eye as well. See I always think they look like they've been sort of slapped in the face with a frying pan. <laughs> Not their fault but it's what I always think of when I look at their faces. They really do and once you see it like that you'll never unsee it. Do you? No you'll never unsee it no. <laughs> so they don't just have these flat faces and circles around them for nothing. So that facial disc and that concave collection of feathers is actually to channel and collect sound waves and directs it all to the owl's ears. So not only is it, is it flat, but it's also quite concave. So it's tunneling all those sound waves towards the owl ears to make them hear even better. And not only that, but the owls can actually adjust the focal length of this sound and collected by adjusting the feathers and that circle around the faces, which is what an incredible um, skill to be able to have. And by being able to do this, it actually means that they can locate prey by sound alone because they're able to judge the distance of where that prey is. And in reality, this means that they can hunt in grasses, in plant cover, but also fascinatingly in snow. So an owl can be gliding along um, in the air and actually hear small mammals that are moving around beneath the snow and pounce in or swoop. That's what owl, owls don't pounce, owls swoop down into the snow. And this is actually an example, a picture of a long-eared owl um, about to descend into the snow. And when looking at pictures of owls hunting in snow, I just didn't know what to pick. So not only have the long-eared owl on its way into the snow. We've got a, a slightly surprised looking barn owl and we'll never know whether he caught his prey or not. He may well have it in his talons, but this picture I just think is absolutely incredible uh, with the uh, owl angel in the snow. So if any of you were lucky enough to see something like this in the recent snow that we had, you know now it was probably an owl hunting and not just a very confused bird. That's, that's an amazing photo. It's, so it's beautiful. just beautiful, yeah. isn't it? Love it. So not only do they have all these facial features, as well as being silent ninjas of the night, they also have other adaptations with their eyes. Um, so birds of prey have the eyes on the side of their heads, which gives them a more well-rounded uh, vision and be able to see in lots of different directions. However, owls, obviously, as demonstrated here, have, our, have eyes very forward facing on the front of their faces. But this actually gives them stereoscopic vision, which means again, that they can have a greater sense of depth perception, which is not only just generally very useful when they're hunting at heights, but also really good in low light, which is obviously what a lot of owls are doing and often hunting either at dusk, sunset or through the night. This does pose some challenges though, because like most birds, their eyes are actually fixed in their sockets, which is why other birds of prey have them on the side of their heads so they can get that like circular vision without having to move their heads much. But obviously I'm telling you a little bit in a moment that owls have found a way around that. Uh, so what I find really interesting actually about owls, but that's because I'm a bit of a nerd, is that owls are actually really quite far-sighted and can't see things a few centimeters from their faces. So they can't actually see the prey that they catch in their talons. But what they do have is these phyllo plumes, which are hair-like feathers on their beaks and on their um, talons, 
which uh, are like feelers in the same way that a cat's whiskers are, and so are able to feel and almost create a picture of the prey in that way. Mm. So I said that owls had come up with a handy way of getting around their eyes being fixed in their sockets and forward facing. Well, they're incredibly bendy as well, as demonstrated by this lovely uh, short-eared owl here. They can <laughs> rotate their necks 270 degrees, which is no easy thing. Uh, they are made more flexible by having 14 neck vertebrae, which is a lot when you consider that humans actually only have seven. Uh, it's not enough to just be able to twist, because if they just had that without other adaptations, every time they turned their heads, they would cut off the blood to their brains. So they also have a lot of adaptations to their circulatory systems. For example, their foramina in their vertebrae, which uh, is where the vertebral arteries pass through. So that point in their spine where those arteries are going through are 10 times the diameter of their arteries, which again is massive when you consider that in humans that the foramina, easy for me to say again, are actually mm -hmm. the size of the arteries because we just don't need that flex. But without it, the owls, yeah, they would be cutting off the blood flow to their brains pretty quickly. Not only that, another one of their adaptations that they have, uh, that their vertebral arteries enter the cervical vertebrae much higher than in other birds, which just means that they've got more slack in the system, more, more reach to give when they're, you know, putting on a big party trick like this short-eared owl. So all of these adaptations combined to make them those iconic birds and the fantastic hunters that we know them to be, putting on that wonderful spectacle of hunting out on paper court meadows at dusk and into the night. Now, for any of you that know me, have been to any of my webinars or walks, you would know by now that I wouldn't be able to give a webinar without at least mentioning hedgerows. And I am lucky enough to lead on the Hedgerow Heritage Project, which we're incredibly lucky to be funded by the Heritage Lottery Fund. So thank you so much to them for valuing hedgerows and letting us do the valuable work that we're going to be doing with planting more hedgerows and getting them into better management in the North Downs. But why are hedgerows important to owls? Well, we have long associated these iconic animals with iconic features in our countryside, as demonstrated by this lovely artwork. Not only that, though, they provide homes and shelter and feeding for small mammals and therefore help to bring lots of prey into areas for our owls. And without them, there would be less wildlife around and less prey for these animals. And not only that, hedgerows are beautiful, they're incredibly valuable and they add texture and grain to our countryside. But of course, I am a little bit biased. Not only are they helping to bring more prey and more biodiversity into our wild spaces and our nature reserves, they're also helping owls as well as lots of other wildlife to be protected from the elements, protected from wind and rain, and obviously most recently, a lot of snow, but also from people and other predators and dogs and anything else that's out and about. They do form at the very least that physical barrier and help to create that more variety in our spaces, which owls and lots of other wildlife really value. And of course that provides those hideaways and roosting spots as well for lots of different species. So oh, we're nearly there. We've taken you on a journey across Papercourt Meadows, introduced you to all of the owls and their some, and I even managed to get a bit about hedgerows in there for you as well. So we wanted to give you a last chance to really feel like you're there. The dramatic skies and incredible weather that Zoe and I have both been lucky enough to sample when out looking at these owls, and obviously the beautiful sunsets that it gives us. And not only that, the odd grainy picture that one of us has managed to try and take on a smartphone and position it in front of binoculars to get a bit closer. And you really do get the full marks if you can see the barn owl in that right hand picture. <laughs> it really is one of our favorite places to visit, isn't Zoe? And we yeah. are yeah. disappointed that we couldn't do the walks, but we really hope you've enjoyed seeing about the place and the owls. And we actually have a couple of videos to show you quickly before we're done. So I'm going to stop sharing. We did practice this. 
So we I did well, and it was slick. <laughs> it was. Can you see that, Zoe? Yes. Excellent. And then hopefully it will just. There we go. So hopefully you can see that's one of our lovely barn owls at sunset. And hopefully you can even hear the excited squealing from Zoe that the owl is hovering. <laughs> that was Brilliant. magical. Yeah. It really was. And then we've just got one more video to show you as well. Other way. There you go. Barn owls gliding off into the sunset. It really does show you how how close you can get. Actually, I mean, we were just walking back to the car park at this stage. We'd already had um, an owl extravaganza, and then all of a sudden there were these two owls flying flying around. We just stopped and videoed it, didn't we? We really did, and I think it just demonstrates how close they are, and the fact that we could yeah. we were able to get this just on our smartphones. So there you go. Thank you so much for coming along and uh, sharing the owls with us. And we really hope that you've all enjoyed having a look at Paper Court and seeing the owls and hearing about why we love the place so much and maybe feel like even though we haven't been able to take you on a walk this time, you feel like you know a little bit more about the place and we've whet your appetite for next time. Is there anything else you want to say, Zoe? No, I think you've summed that up really nicely. Thanks, Katie. <laughs> was incredible absolutely loved that boy i'm putting paper court meadows on my list in the future so thank you guys so much um really learned a lot tonight um but we've got lots of questions so um i'm going to hand you over to victoria to start no problem yeah thank you katie and zoe it was absolutely fabulous i think they're the most beautiful birds absolutely beautiful um so the questions have come flying in um, so <laughs> I'll good. start off. We, we've got one uh, from Rebecca and Beverly's, uh, a similar question. Um, they want to know when is the best time to go owl spotting um, and also to go spotting at, at Paper Court? Um, uh, well, it depends what species you want to see. Um, do correct me, Katie, on this if, if, if you want to add to it. But um, barn owls, you can probably see all year round, um, but obviously you do need to be going at the sort of dusk time. So the, the more into spring and summer you get, the obviously the it gets darker later, et cetera, et cetera, and more people are out and about. Um, but the short eared owls, um, really sort of January, February time. I'm not sure about March, Casey. Do you think that's, is that still okay? Maybe very early March. Yeah, um, because most of them are sort of migrants. So um, yeah, if, if you really want a sort of good owl extravaganza, we use it. This is why we usually do the walks in February because you, you've got more of a chance. It's why we risk the weather because it is <laughs> yes. time to see them. <laughs> so yeah, you, if you're lucky, you can arrive there, see the short-eared owls just before sunset. They sort of go and hunker down and then the barn owls come out around dusk because it's starting to get dark. And then once it's got dark, you start to hear the tawny owls twitching mm -hmm. away. And you're very lucky if you get all three in one night. <laughs> Thank you. So the next question is from Carol. Uh, do tawny owls return to the same nest for breeding each time? They don't tend to, actually. Um, they will set up nests anywhere. So some of them we talked about returning to the same nest, but um, tawnies um, will happily set up nests. Again, they're a bit of a, um, a user of other people's old nests as well. Um, so, yeah, they're not quite as romantic as that. Thank you. Uh, we have a question from Neil. Why are owls deemed to be wise? That's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> Well, in actual fact, I mean, owls aren't really that much cleverer than any other bird species. I would say that the sort of rooks and ravens and, and birds like that probably are, are more wise and more clever. But a lot of it seems to stem back from Greek mythology. So um, gods like Athena, 
um, who were a symbol of wisdom, were quite often pictured with an owl in the background, etc. Um, and some uh, Greek mythology thought that owls had this kind of inner light within them that sort of enabled them to see in the dark before they really understood. So there's not really one answer to that, but basically myth, um, magic, fairies, that kind of that kind of stuff. I don't know if you want to add to that, Katie. But... No, I, th I think you've summed it up beautifully. <laughs> Okay, so the next question is for Richard. How do you identify between the short-eared and the tawny? Shall I answer that one, Zoe? Yeah, I'm perfect. Um, so they are slightly different sizes. A short-eared owl is a little bit bigger. And obviously the really stereotypical thing is those eyes. So if you remember, I mentioned that the tawny owls have those like wholly dark brown eyes. They don't have any yellow or rings around it. At all. So that's a really distinguishing factor. Obviously their calls also, but also the habitat that you'll find them in and the times of day that you're seeing them. Like I said, tawny owls really are woodland specialists. They come out and they hunt over open ground at night, but if you're lucky, you'll see a silhouette. And you really, if you're going to see a tawny owl in the day, you've just been very lucky that you found it in its roosting spot um, mm -hmm. up in a tree. Whereas short-eared owls, you will see out gliding across open areas in the daytime as well. Thank you. Um, we have one uh, from Helen here. Is it true that barn owl's feathers are not waterproof, making them the most silent flyer? Yes, it is. Um, uh, the soundproofness comes at a cost, basically. So with all of the features that Katie took us through earlier and those feather structures um, does indeed make those, those feathers not waterproof, yeah. Okay. Why you won't see them necessarily flying in the rain, they prefer not to. Yeah, yeah. Actually, that's a really good point. And it comes back to one of one of the questions about the best time of year to see it, weather conditions as well. Katie's hit the nail on the head there. You know, wet, windy and all of that kind of stuff, don't go. If it's a nicer evening when things are calmer, you know, the evening is is perhaps a little bit sunny, absolutely go. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, we've had a question from someone that wants to re remain anonymous. Um, they said, thank you for a wonderful talk, um, but they'd like to know how many pairs are in residence around Papercourt and where else locally are good places to spot owls? Oh, that's a great question. So I would say there are, and Zoe, you will also have to uh, add to this potentially. I'd say those numbers can fluctuate year on year. So, but generally I think there's around two pairs of barn owls that I've seen regularly out on paper court. There could well be more, sometimes there may be less, but I quite regularly see two pairs, especially when we're out on the walks. Um, short ears, I'd say we've got two, two birds. Mm. But again, that is much more likely to fluctuate. So last year, I didn't see any short ears out on the walks. Obviously we didn't get out as much as we would have liked due to the thing, mm. but, um, those numbers can massively swell as well so from when we're saying about the numbers we can get up to 50,000 individuals in the winter and if we had one of those bumpy years it wouldn't surprise me if we had three or even four short-eared owls on somewhere like paper mm. I would say as an average it's around two pairs so four barn owls and one pair of short-eared owls yeah I would totally agree with pretty that. lucky yeah totally agree yeah um, when considering other areas, um, it depends what species you want to go and look at. So those pictures that I showed you of the uh, fledglings or owlets were taken on sheepleys and those were tawny owls. So most woodland um, in the evenings, like good mature woodland, um, especially ancient woodland, which obviously in Surrey we're quite lucky to have a lot of, is very likely to have tawny owls in it. Um, as Zoe said, we could have little owls on um, on paper court as well, and they could be anywhere. They're they're quite they're not quite secretive, but they're also not gliding around in the middle of the day either. So, and it really is about getting out there, keeping your eyes peeled for the barn owls and the short ears. It's that kind of grassland areas as well. Zoe. Any specific areas you think no I think that's great I mean it just reminded me actually I ran a, a guided walk last year on sheepleys and just one of the walk members came up to me and they said hey look at this I've still got this photo um, and they'd just been driving their car down a country lane and there was a little owl just just 
on one of the fence posts and he stopped and took a picture of it. It was absolutely amazing. And he just couldn't believe his luck, you know. And, oh, um, wow. And there it was. So it's just right, right place, right time. Mm. And uh, little, owl, little, little owls as well. I was going to call it a little short owl then. Wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> little owls are often also associated with farmland. So if mm. you mature oaks in a farmland setting it's worth just sort of scanning the branches and any little hollows and things like that because you could have little owls in there or even a roosting thorny owl so it really is about just keeping your eyes peeled never never expecting what species be there always look up always be looking around and think you can see anything because that's when you see things Thank you, Katie and Zoe. Um, I have a question from Jill. She would like to know where's the best place to park? Yeah, there's actually, so that map um, that I showed, um, I can't remember the name of the road actually that it's on, but there is- Old a, Newark? Yeah, Old Newark. If you type Old Newark um, car park into Google Maps, it actually comes up and and that's the car park that you could see my van um kind of half drowning in and coming through and it, it does show on google maps it's really random i'm not entirely sure who owns it you don't have to pay or anything uh it could probably hold up to 20 cars it's it's a bit bumpy you know you need to be it's a sort of countryside car park but it does take you quite close to site so and then you just have to walk along the river and then over over the bridge by the lock and then you're on to paper court meadows yeah. um i've got a message from keith here to say great presentation thank you so much uh do the owls range all over paper court yeah they do actually um like i said you know we when Keisha was showing those videos um those were actually off our site and on the walk back to the car park um, and you never quite know where they're going to be so as Casey said when you go over the bridge into site you're sort of constantly scanning left or right not necessarily knowing um, where they're going to come from so it, it I would say um, often you can pick them up and maybe you're sort of moving yourself into an area where you're a bit closer for example but yeah I, I'd say they they do. Mm, I'd agree. Uh, I've got uh, quite a long question here from Emma. Uh, she wants again to say thank you for a really lovely talk and love the photo of the owl print left in the snow. I think that was one of my favourites as well. That was wonderful. Um, uh, so Emma asks, are there any issues of interspecific competition between the different owl species? Uh, do any of the owl species outcompete any other owls or do they all coexist quite happily? That's a good question. Yeah. Um I'm sure Zoe might have something to add to this as well, but I'd say the short answer is no. They, they've all uh, developed over millions of years competing and existing together. So no, I'd say they live quite harmoniously. Obviously the little owl has been introduced, but it builds a niche that the other owls aren't doing. They all perform slightly different roles, even though a lot of them have quite similar diets. Now I think they all uh, coexist quite well. I mean, obviously things like Tommy as they're very, territorial so we'll fight most things off their patch as a lot of species will but no I'd say they all coexist very well. Thank you so I've got one question here which we can kind of um, answer so Ginny has just asked um, is Papercourt Meadows open to the public uh, yes yes it is. Yes it is um, absolutely yeah, yeah. And uh, she just wanted to know, was the presentation recorded? Because uh, she was a bit held up and joined a bit later. And yes, this presentation is recorded and it will appear on the website. Um, I'm not sure how long, you may have to wait a week or so, but it will appear and uh, you can watch it again. Thank you. I think that is all the questions. Um, so unless anyone's got a last minute one they want to ask. Um, I'll well, I think hand back to Sue. Well, I think Ginny kind of stole what I was going to say because this is being recorded. So if you found it as fascinating as I did, tell your friends. You can pick up the uh, video, and as you said, probably about a week, um, both on our website and on YouTube. Um, but uh, other than that, we really I can't thank the both of you enough so much for sharing so much information with us. 
I hope everybody out there had enjoyed the evening. We This is a regular event that we're having pretty much every Wednesday these days. Um, on these cold winter evenings, what better way to spend it than <laughs> learning a little <laughs> bit about nature when we can get back out there again. Um, so I just wanted to thank you again and um, we will hopefully see you all in the future. So have a very great evening and um, we'll say goodbye. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, everybody. And thank you thank to everyone that donated any money towards these, these uh, presentations and talks. We, we are so grateful. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Okay. So we'll just wait until everybody kind of takes off.